Okay, we can get started. Great. So, uh, welcome everyone to this session. This is a panel discussion on software defined storage in OpenStack. So, if you're here to listen to that, you're in the right place. Um, we're, we have a fairly distinguished panel uh, with a lot of years of uh, expertise, not only in storage, but in OpenStack. Um, so, I'm, I'm going to have some questions that we're going to kind of go through as a panel. Uh, but we also have mics set up, so uh, near the end, I will ha we'll have time for you to come up, uh, walk up to the mic, and ask the panel some uh, questions. So, a uh, good place for us to start, I think, is obviously do some introductions. So, uh, I'll, my name is Ken Hoy. I, am, uh, I used to be at Rackspace on the OpenStack team there. Currently, I am at EMC as a business development manager for their OpenStack uh, Cloud Solutions business group. So, and I will be moderating today's panel. So let me go ahead and have the panelists listen to themselves. So I'm Eyal Baron. I'm, I was previously at Red Hat managing the cloud storage engineering group. And today I'm cloud CTO in Huawei. I'm Mike Perez. I am the project technical lead for Sender for the Kilo release. And I work at Datera. Uh, my name is Sage Weil. Um, I was previously at Ink Tank, co-founder of working on Ceph. And most now I'm at Red Hat. Hi, my name is Shamal Zahir. I'm with EMC in the Office of CTO, working as a cloud architect. And I'm John Griffith. I work at SolidFire. Um, I worked on Cinder for the past few years. I used to be the PTL, and then now I'll turn over to Mike. Thanks, gentlemen. So uh, just to kick things off, I think uh, you know, in our pa in previ from previous summits and also in our prep for this panel, one of the things I think we can agree on is there is no one single definition that everyone agrees on about what software-defined storage is, let alone what it is in, in OpenStack. <laughs> so maybe a quick way to kick off the panel discussion is to have you, each of the panelists, talk about how would you quickly, def how would you define software-defined storage, uh, and how would you define it in the context of uh, a cloud platform like OpenStack? Yeah, we'll go down the line. Well, in my view, there are several characteristics that uh, SDS needs to meet. Um, one of them, of course, is separation of control and data plane, and a lot of the contention is about what that means. So control plane has uh, three elements. One is the configuration, the other one is the element uh, layout, and the third one is the storage services. And um, the question is, where do you draw the line? Do you, uh, do you separate all of these three or just the configuration? Um, the second uh, characteristic is programmable APIs. So you want to automate and uh, drive storage policies from the API. And the third one, which is probably also contentious, uh, the ability to run on commodity servers. Okay, thank you. Um, so for myself, uh, I'm very much just thinking uh, software-defined storage is leveraging virtualization to create an abstract between the data and hardware uh, so that we can have virtualized representations of that storage hardware so that I can have a pooling of dissimilar storage systems and into a cohesive centrally managed uh, representation of the available resources regardless of the underlying hardware and as well as the, st the system platforms themselves or their physical location. Um, I'm, I think that the problem with soft, the term software-defined storage is it doesn't define what storage means, um, aside from the fact mm -hmm. that it's not hardware. So everybody at least agrees on that. Um, I think you can, some people define it to be the, the software that makes a storage endpoint appear that you can then interact with. Um, so you can sort of plug in existing boxes. Um, other people define it to be the actual guts of the storage system that are handling the replication of data across nodes and making it reliable and redundant and so forth. Um, it's probably not the actual bits on a disk because that's, that's not software. I think that the key thing, though, is in any sort of discussion about software-defined storage, it probably makes sense to sort of leave the term behind and try to talk about what it is you're actually talking about, whether it's a unified control plane, which is you know, useful, um, or it's the, the software that's actually managing the storage of your data, the actual guts of the system, which is also pretty valuable, and then asking the question about what that's actually providing you. you know, what, what freedoms is it giving you in terms of um, freedom from hardware vendors or software vendors or software freedoms in general? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely agree that the term is kind of vague, so we need to kind of go beyond the term and into mm -hmm. the actual what it means and, and to the points everyone else raised. It's basically data and control plane. So from a control plane perspective, it's about abstraction and being able to provide some level of interface regardless of what the actual element, element management is for the underlying array that you're trying to control in a sense. So that's the control side. And then on the data side, you've, you've got the aspect of you know pooling hardware, whether it's commodity, whether it's not, but basically being able to have some sort of data plane initiative to effectively create a uh, virtual array, or as you called it last time, I think software-based storage uh, on top of uh, hardware of any type effectively. Yeah, so uh, this is kind of interesting. Um, I've, I've been very vocal about my opinions on this over the past couple of years. Um, the thing that's cool, though, is we all kind of seem to be converging a little bit. Um, hmm. So uh, I've, I've felt that it was, at, it, at its core, a separation of control path and data path, right? And that was pretty much the end of my definition. It was pretty broad. Um, I think we're kind of getting closer to being on the same page, so that's kind of cool. So let's talk about what is, you know, so you had now several defini definitions of what software-defined storage is. What do you think is the value that it brings? Why is it important to think about that, particularly, again, in the OpenStack context? Anyone? So um, I'll... Um, so from my perspective, you know, I look at it in a number of ways. One of the biggest values and the most important criteria um, is probably automation in the API uh, and, and flexibility. Um, and then we start getting into the other things people talked about, virtualization of resources and stuff like that. Um, those are the key components, and the reason I think they're key components is that's the only way you can effectively make things like OpenStack, um, you know, cloud computing, new generation data center type stuff. That's the only way you can make it work. Um, the, the whole point is we want to get away from, you know, the, the intense proprietary management and things like that that you have to do with these products and so on and so forth. Um, in some ways, you could view Cinder as doing that job for you. Um, at the same time, though, Cinder does it much, much better if you have a product on the back end that actually implements those characteristics, right? So that's kind of, in my opinion, that's kind of in a nutshell why I think it's important. Yeah, de definitely agree, and it basically allows a, a level, uh, it provides a means to provide an API that you don't have to know the underlying storage plumbing or be generally, you know, an expert in the storage aspect to be able to reap the benefits of storage within a, within the cloud itself. So the API provides value in that aspect of consumption but then on the data plane side of the definition as well, uh, there's value to be had of you know, s um, converged uh, scaling between compute and storage resources as well for the cloud. So that, that's a benefit on the data side, I think. Um, I think for me, the definition really comes down to freedom. Um, so if you sort of start at the top of the stack and you're talking just about control planes, having that sort of unified integration into whatever software orchestration stack you have means you can plug in any vendor solution. So you have the freedom to choose between you know, existing proprietary vendors or open source vendors or whatever you want. Um, and as you move down the stack, you, you get other sorts of freedom. So for the data plane, for the actual guts of the storage system, um, then you can have um, independence from your hardware vendors. So you can buy your hardware from any white box, whatever vendor that you want. Um, and if it's open source software, then you also have the freedom where you actually don't even have to swap out the storage system itself. You can just choose which company you want to support that software, um, which I think is sort of the ultimate, or perhaps support it yourself, which I think is the ultimate um, you know, realization, I guess, of that, that software freedom. Um, so I think in, in any sort of conversation about this, you, for me, it's always a question of um, what, is, what is the solution and is it actually giving me more or less freedom in that context, both from, from the vendors and from the hardware perspective and from the ability to swap out different software? Uh, reiterating those points, but also the point that I made earlier in the definition of having a central place for uh, of a bunch of dissimilar storage systems, and having that idea of being able to, in a sense, uh, be able to have one pool storage of just dissimilar storage systems. Uh, but so that's from the operator's perspective. On the end user, I mean, really, I think the end user doesn't necessarily care what the back end really looks like. They just want resources readily available so that they could get back to what they were doing. So I'll just add one more aspect. And the reason you need programmable APIs is because you need to deploy a lot more uh, um, storage. And you need to scale up and scale out, sorry, uh, a lot more than before. 
And part of that, the economics are such that uh, classic uh, storage arrays just cost too much. So that's part of the commodi commodi commoditization of storage. Took me a while. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you'd like to run on x86 and also simplify your storage. So um, part of it is that you don't want uh, too many types of storage uh, in the back end. You actually want, for simplicity's sake, to choose one of your choice, so that goes to uh, freedom, and scale out with it um, supposedly infinitely. Okay. So based on some of the things you've said, it, uh, someone could argue that you all you're doing is defining what Cinder is. So I guess the question is, is Cinder in fact all there is to say about software-defined storage, or is there elements in that are missing within Cinder uh, that either you can put into Cinder or that a vendor could add and implement, plug into Cinder to, to implement other aspects of SDS? Any thoughts? Um, anyone? So Cinder does abstract uh, the, the different vendor APIs and provides a single API that the entire industry can use and uh, program against. What it does not provide is the layout and storage services themselves. So just using Cinder does not give you that scalability, does not give you those capabilities. You still need something on the back end that can provide that. Um, whether or not Cinder should go there, that's a different question. Um, not sure. Okay. Anyone else, thoughts yeah. on that? Um, so I, I, I think that to a certain degree, yes, Cinder actually is providing uh, part of what we called SDS. And to the other question, yes, there's a lot more that we can do and should do. Um, the second part is, is whether that should be provided from a plugin. Um, my answer to that is no, because then that kind of defeats the purpose. But what, what needs to happen is those devices that you plug in as back ends, they have to have the virtualization and automation capabilities so that you can actually expose that through Cinder. So one of the things that holds Cinder back right now is the fact that we do have legacy storage systems in there that don't know how to do things like virtualization and good automation and stuff like that. So we can't get everything up to the same speed that we would like it to be. Uh, and that's kind of a problem. And it's something that we're trying to address and I think we're going to fix. Um, and, and we've definitely got plans in Kilo to make that better. So, so when you say address, what does that mean? That's, I mean, uh, you talk, yeah. it sounds almost like you're saying, uh, well, this legacy storage can't do SDS within Cinder, so therefore we're going to bypass them and either create it ourselves within Cinder or use some other technology. So we're going to fake it. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to help some of those guys that are further down and in, in back in the old legacy world and stuff like that uh -huh. who can't do certain things. We're going to help them fake it inside of the Cinder code and make Cinder a place where we can actually try and pretend that they actually work the way that they All should. All play together. System. All play together. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. What some other folks on the panel? Is that a good idea? Is that a is that a bad idea? What are your thoughts on that? I think it, it seems like it's generally a good idea. I mean, mm -hmm. Cinder is definitely solving that control plane problem, right, where you mm -hmm. have a single interface that lets you orchestrate these other systems. Um, I think that it seems like it's a it's a it's a sliding scale, though. Like you can you either pick the most like generic common denominator of all the systems, and you get something that's only modestly useful, but every vendor can plug into and call themselves software-defined, which is, which, is <laughs> yeah, sure, which is where we are today. Um, or you can, so you have, at some point, you're going to have to pick, pick a stopping point. Like, you, you, you're going to have some APIs that only certain systems implement, um, and others won't. And so it's, you know, there's no, I think there's no silver bullet. Um, but I think, it, I would assume that everybody sort of agrees that Cinder um, is mainly concerned with that, that control plane, right? It's not actually a storage system. It's not, you're not using Cinder software to define the actual, right? Yeah. And I don't think there's much interest in implementing. So, yeah, and, and to that point, it, there is a reference implementation that uses LVM. Um, that is the probably lowest common denominator, right? Um, I would love to see that improve and get better, um, or, you know, or whether it's replaced with something else as the reference, that's fine. But yeah, I think to your point. But then if you want to fake it, as you said, right, you have to provide those capabilities. So it's either... You do provide a default implementation and use either use an architecture like uh, OpenGL where you have a soft Cinder software implementation and offload to storage where possible because as under the assumption that th your storage, if it provides these capabilities, will do them better. Or you do a, uh, an, a completely new implementation, uh, 
but you can't fake it otherwise, right? It's no, actually you can. I mean, we, we, we so so we do things today where we fake it, right? Um, we 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 can fake things inside of Cinder to make devices that don't actually support things actually work. Um, we can pretend that a device has the notion of a pool, right? So then that way, devices that do use pools, sorry for them, um, they can actually still work and function and get value extracted and everything else. So, so that's one example. Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is, is there's a difference between faking it in a driver and faking it in the top layer inside of Cinder. And, and the main point I was trying to get at was what's needed inside of Cinder more than anything else is smarter scheduling capabilities, smarter, you know, more hand-on, uh, you know, fine-grained control. That's what's needed. Um, the problem and the reason why that's hard in an OpenStack context especially is because there are so many back-end products out there that don't have those capabilities. They don't expose that sort of functionality to you. So, Which is where a default uh, implementation would come in handy, right? How do you pick the right one? <laughs> you don't. It's it's just an implementation. It's not the best. If you want the best, you probably buy the best of breed on your underlying storage. You don't expect um, to get you know to have your cake and eat it too. Sure, to an extent. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I follow completely. But well, yeah. if you do provide a full implementation, right, but you only use it when the underlying storage does not comply with the needs, sure, right, then you've solved the 80-20 and the rest that want something very highly, you know, with high performance, et cetera, they will buy the hardware that provides those capabilities. Yeah, and, and maybe this is where it also comes into play of, you know, what data services you expose and what the use cases that you're supporting, because again, that's, that's another spectrum that everything varies on as well, yeah. along with the performance and virtualization aspects. So we've got to factor that in too, and then maybe that's where the Cinder minimum API comes into effect as well. So, uh, most of you know, I think, there, there have been uh, code submitted to, by vendors, various vendors, not just one, um, to essentially have that functionality you've talked about that you want to put in the center as part of a vendor's plugin. So, uh, is the message that you're advocating that those vendors shouldn't do that anymore? They should just submit all the code back into sender? Or w what is the message for those vendors? And how they want it, you know, because they you want know to You know the answer that to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, wh well, how would you talk to those vendors? Because they may yeah. say, that's the way we, you know, one of the things that make OpenStack such a rich ecosystem is right. we allow people, vendors, the ability to I innovate and to add value yeah. right, from their solution. And now it sounds like an argument could be made that you're trying to take that away. So uh, I, this, this has been an ongoing debate, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the, the stuff that I've been pretty public about and I've written about. Um, so my perspective on this is those taking the idea, what Ken's talking about, is taking the idea of, hey, here's a driver for Cinder that actually does all of this fancy scheduling, all of this advanced control path stuff, all of these things that we're talking about up here today. Um, it does all of that, it just plugs into Cinder and you're done. My argument against that is that actually is um, detrimental to the Cinder project because the point that I'm trying to make sitting up here right now is, all of that functionality is the functionality that we should be putting inside of Cinder, not in a Cinder driver. So the fact is, is you know, people can sit up here and say, oh, well, it's really hard and it's watered down and you have to pick the lowest common denominator. Well, these drivers that they're proposing are doing the exact same thing. So all I'm saying is there's absolutely no reason to actually have that extra layer. The reality is we should all be focused on actually putting that functionality and those, those features inside of Cinder itself and making Cinder better, as opposed to basically forking out all these different drivers. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, yeah, so I completely agree with that. And I think you know, that, that kind of broadens the conversation to it, it, is Cinder's role beyond just you know, block storage as well as moving forward, because that's one of the key elements that we've been talking about as well, is, is you know, the SDS notion of block versus block object and file. And then on top of that, you know, the, the layer cake, if you will, is definitely not productive. But at the same time, if there's no alternative, um, you know, it would be nice to have it as an option, but the game plan long term should be to have a model where you don't have to have a layer cake necessarily. Other thoughts on the panel? Um, so my thoughts, if you were at the Linus Summit, uh, know that it very much echoes what John has already said. 
Um, and my, my main fear about it is that it's going to create silos inside of uh, the storage project. And in general, I just, I, I feel like that, uh, you know, once, you know, like what, what is the point uh, for a lot of us to even meet uh, about at the, for the Cinder Summit at that point about what new features that we want to introduce? Because, um, I mean, at that point, I kind of feel like, well, vendor A and vendor B is already doing, I, I don't even want to think of the nightmare of what the that uh, feature matrix is going to look like at that mm -hmm. point. Um, in fact, that's very much what we got rid of. And so if I have, you know, a variety of vendors that could do something a lot better than what can be done inside of Cinder. And while the, I fear at that point, there's going to be this shift where there's going to be some of us still meeting at the summit and trying to implement those features. You know, they're still trying to work together in an open source way. And unfortunately, again, it goes back to there's going to be silos created and another feature matrix. And it's going to be a huge nightmare for the uh, operators to know what exactly uh, they're going to get from this particular vendor. It's going to completely move away from the idea of what I feel like some of us have been saying on SDS. And having this, uh, again, this headache that the operator is going to have to think about what they are deploying uh, between you know two different storage, two totally different similar st or dissimilar storage systems. I think it's um I think it's a bit of a um, identity issue also for OpenStack and Cinder mm -hmm. as a whole um, because if you think about it every vendor who's involved in the OpenStack ecosystem is incentivized to have as much <laughs> functionality in their particular specific mm -hmm. proprietary plugin as possible so they can sell their product and contribute the minimum amount to OpenStack that allows OpenStack users to leverage their functionality and I think our goal as a community and everybody in this room and people who are not solely beholden to to their commercial entity is to actually build a larger community that, that pushes as much of that development effort into creating common functionality that benefits everyone so that you can then spend the rest of your time or the vendor can focus on making their product good and the community as a whole will benefit from all the common functionality. And I think any, in general, if we sort of use that criteria for deciding what path to take for the project, um, then I think everyone will be a little bit better served. I, I, I would definitely agree with that. I, I do want to point out exception though I, I don't want the uh, the the vendors are only interested in their driver and their plugin um, cinder in particular um, is is a good community where we actually have done a really good job of vendors even though we are very vendor centric and very vendor heavy they do an extremely good job of pushing their their changes through all of the Cinder code upstream and making Cinder better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm an example of that. Mike is an example of that. Folks from EMC, there's a number of folks, folks from NetApp. Yeah. So how would you address customers who go, that's a great idea. I love this idea of pushing software to find storage into Cinder itself, but you, the community moves too slow. And I want the functionality and I need it now. How about, um, so I want to implement vendor A uh, software-defined storage solution, we, but I also want compatibility with the OpenStack, so I want to be in this part of the Cinder project. What, what, how would you address anyone on the panel? So, Cinder today, you can just, the vendor can just uh, supply their uh, customers with a Cinder driver, right? doesn't have to be merged into the code base in order to do that, and it can comply with any uh, version of the API. So there's no really, no real issue there. Right. Except some customer, I've talked to some customers who, uh, rightly or wrongly, right, they see the, the fact that the codes in the co is in the repo as a kind of a stamp of certification. And like so, there are customers who will say, "I'm not going to implement something, even though it's API compatible, unless it's made it into the into the trunk." So the way you work in open source is that you always, when you, when you work in a project, you always take the, the point of view of that project, right? And what is best for that project. And in Cinder, it's in Cinder's best interest mm -hmm. not to allow these uh, uh, drivers in because it forces the vendors to uh, provide this functionality in Cinder. Mm -hmm. The same way that Cinder did revolutionize uh, storage APIs by providing a an API that all the vendors nowadays comply with, right? And it's open. If we go to something like uh, Viper from EMC, mm -hmm. then that detracts value, as uh, John says, and it drives customers to um, integrate against a proprietary API, so they don't have the freedom that they need. Okay. So in general, I'd say that's the vendor's problem. Right, right. okay.
Anyone else? Comments on that or thoughts on how to y help those customers who want the functionality yeah, now? Yeah, you know, so so this is a, an argument that that comes up, you know, fairly often. Um, so I've I've been working on Cinder since it started. I started the project and, and everything else, and I talk to a lot of users, a lot of customers, and stuff like that. The fact is, I have yet to come across a customer or a user that says to me, "Hey, I don't have enough choices or enough options for what I can do with Cinder." I have yet to have a single person come up and say that to me. I have had plenty of vendors come to me and say that to push their specific feature and stuff like that, but I don't have any real data. Um, so if there are people out here that are operators and users and stuff like that, we would love that kind of feedback. So if it's out there, don't go to your vendor with it. Please bring it to the OpenStack community and let us know. Because um, right now, we're not aware that that's a big gap. Okay, That's actually a good transition, unless someone else has another comment on this. How do, obviously this panel is really just the, be, you know, another beginning of this discussion. What's, um, but I don't think it, it helps us to have this discussion only every six months, right? We need to have this as an ongoing discussion. So what's the best way, um, for example, you're saying, hey, we want feedback from users and operators. What's the best way to get that feedback to the Cinder community so that you can, you guys can all take that into account? Mike, maybe, Mike, do you? PTL. <laughs> um, well, you certainly know what I look like. I'm kind of hard to uh, not find. <laughs> um, but you know that won't scale. Uh, so I mean, certainly you're more you're more than welcome to uh, you know reach out to us. Uh, I know maybe IRC and and the OpenStack mailing list may be a bit daunting, but uh, that's currently how the OpenStack community uh, embraces ideas right now. Um, so, I mean, feel free to, you know, start up an idea. Uh, you can also be suggesting uh, everything from the design summits. I mean, we take everybody's uh, different topics in and we kind of discuss them out whether or not this is something that we think can just be, you know, done without a discussion or whether it needs an actual discussion um, if we don't think it would be make much sense over IRC. So um, I guess what I'm saying, embrace those, you know, different ways to, you know, get something out. But I also wanted to echo exactly what John said. I mean, I I've also have been uh, into plenty of speaking sessions myself uh, and going to a variety of conferences talking about OpenStack. And it, it's sort of the same I idea that I, I don't think a lot of the users I talk to either, you know, they're not sure what they want from Cinder yet, um, or, you know, they're excited about what it does already and they haven't exactly dived into it yet. But uh, I've always been very welcome to anybody who wants to reach out to me about what you want to see next in Cinder. I just wanted to add real yeah. quick, um, you know, Mike talks about IRC and stuff like that. The other thing is our Twitter handles are all up there. Tweet. Just send us a tweet. Uh, well, send us an email. I, I can't even read it. I'm right here. Oh. It's on, uh, uh, so if you go to the schedule um, and look up the speaker profile, they, the Twitter's on there. JDG underscore eight. Send me a tweet. I'll forward it to Mike. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, he's handing out my business cards um, this time. <laughs> um, so, but uh, also, I mean, I check the OpenStack uh, user mailing list. Um, you know, every other day. So, I mean, please, you know, make sure to, you know, try to reach out on there. And, you know, if it's something that somebody else hasn't already chimed on, then, you know, I'll be on there. So, so we got ten more, about 10 minutes. So, um, as, pr as I promised, I wanted to leave the floor open for some questions from, from you, you know, audience. So, if you've got some questions for the panel, um, I invite you to walk up to one of the microphones and just speak out loud and we'll try to address them. And if you have a question for a specific panelist, please uh, state that. Otherwise, you know anyone from the panel can can try to answer. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Simon Dodson from Pure Storage. Just going back a little bit to what you were talking about, you know, the added features and deciding what's a standard or not a standard, and what vendor provides what. Let's think about something very generic like replication. How do you decide what goes into Cinder Core and what doesn't, and what has to be done? via those drivers, let's think, because replication could be synchronous, asynchronous, full copy-based, snapshot-based, consistency groups, no consistency groups. Where does that define? Because it goes to your point about the support matrix. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead, anyone? 
so the way we the way we handle that right now um, is is basically we just did replication, and the way we define replication is a use case, and we say this is the use case that we're trying to achieve. The the problem, like you mentioned, is there's different types of replication. It means different things to different people, and it's implemented differently. Um, where we're at today is that's an implementation detail. Um, the thing that's cool about that, though, is you can have a device that does asynchronous versus another one that does synchronous. And what we can do is we can set up things like, hey, here's a volume type that's specifically for synchronous replication. And here's one for asynchronous replication. And then depending on which one of those volume types you're picking, it's going to choose the appropriate back end to get you what you want. But does that ne then not go to the point about the operators having to do that more, much more thinking about what they've got in their back end or not? I, I don't think you're ever going to get to a point where the operator doesn't have to do any thinking, right? I, I, think, um, I think that's something that is, um, it's, it's a cool idea and it's, it's neat. But the thing is, is until you get to a point where you have a single homogenous environment, um, I, I don't think that's realistic. Um, and I don't think it's what most people want. Most people actually, they want to have diversity. They have reasons for diversity, right? Um, there's, there's plenty of good reasons why you might need different types of storage and, and different types of behaviors, uh, whether it be cost, whether it be power, whether it be performance, whatever it might be. Um, so I don't, I don't think that should be taken out of the equation. Um, I think what Mike was getting at more was more about, I don't have to worry about, hey, is this API call going to actually work? That's the kind of thing that I think he was getting at more, as opposed to, is it going to behave exactly the same way, and what do I have to know about it? So you're talking about effectively extra specs and adding those into the core? Yeah, so right now we, we do that through extra specs, and it's a manual process. And what I'm suggesting is, in the, in the future release, what we should be doing is looking at things like how to make the scheduler more intelligent. So how to expose things to the admin, to the ops guy that, or ops girl that says, hey, these are the capabilities that are being reported from your pool of storage devices, right? And here's how you can set up different scheduling and stuff like that, right? So help you along with that and give you those tools to actually make it better. So by putting those into the core, for example, you would be standardizing so you don't go off and have a different extra spec that does exactly the same thing with a slightly different name from two different vendors. Yeah, and, and that's the hard part, right, is, is getting everybody to actually agree on what that is. But I think if you draw a line in the sand and you start, you can still do your customization and get things your own unique way through an extra spec, but you can also get some goodness through the automation, through the scheduler. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that? Or? Just one more little thing. So. Uh, of course, the operator needs to know uh, about storage, but once you've defined a free set of uh, policies that you want in your data center, from that point on, everything is automatic, right? You just choose what policy you'd like, and it automatically, behind the scenes, goes and provisions what you need. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Uh, feel free to walk up to the microphone. Once, twice. Okay. Um, uh, I was going to ask Paz, do you have any closing comments? Or do you have questions for the I, other panelists? I, I just, <laughs> no, I just had a quick question because we were talking earlier yeah. about IRC and mailing lists. So yeah. just quick, how, how many of you are on the mailing list in IRC already? Just to see how much feedback. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, All right, yeah I was just gauging like how, how many people yeah. are there. So we can continue getting feedback, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Any, if, any, uh, anyone else? got to have questions. Man, you guys on the panel have any anything you want to close with? Um, maybe a, a general question would be what um, what kinds of features or capabilities people actually are looking to see out of Cinder or a control plane in general. You don't want to let us run a <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my legs asleep. Oh. Hey guys, uh, Lee Calcote from Cisco. Um, two questions. Uh, going back to your prior topic uh, on vendor plugins and kind of pros versus cons on having you know sort of a ubiquitous amount of um, or you know a common layer of functionality versus vendor specific you know, capabilities. Is there? I guess a different way of phrasing that question. Is there? Um, you, other than aspiring to have that functionality in Cinder, is there uh, at any point do you guys sort of prevent or discourage vendors from building out 
functionality within a given plugin? <coughs> or do you just aspire to absorb it as you go? I'm not sure I follow. Um. Yeah, I guess phrased differently. So <coughs> um, some of the vendors are, are contributing and building out their own plugins sure. uh, for capabilities. And as you're going along, you're you're incorporating what you can into the into the community and encouraging them encouraging them to do so. And I guess you know, as a, it's sort of a sensitive topic from what I gather. Uh, this is actually my first time kind of paying attention to Cinder, so apologies <laughs> for the ignorance here. But uh, is there uh, uh, have there been points in time where specific vendors have been discouraged from building out um, you know capabilities that that aren't contributed back? Or? So, um, it, so if you mean building it out in terms of putting those capabilities inside of the driver and the driver only, um, no, I, I don't. I think there's certain cases where that has been true. Um, if it did things like change the behavior of the API, right? But in terms of things like um, you know, our, the the solid fire driver that I work on in particular is a really good example. Um, so a long time ago, I put QoS support, quality of service support, in there. We were the only ones at the time that had it. We are the only ones that do it the way we do it. Um, so it is very much custom. But the thing is, is that's what we give the vehicle of things like extra specs, and now we have QoS specs, right? Because now there's other definitions of QoS. Um, but we provide that vehicle, and we welcome that. I mean, that's a good thing, because, because really, the bottom line is, is if, if you just give somebody one vanilla thing for Cinder, it's not doing anybody any good, right? I mean, that's, that's not making anybody happy. Um, so there has to be a way to expose those features, and, and it is welcomed. The, the thing that changes is when we get to this point where you start to duplicate features that are already in Cinder or meet the definition of Cinder or that should be in Cinder. Right. So Makes that, sense to me. Helps? Yeah, it does. Um, last one is um, just a request for comment. Uh, so, so today Seagate um, announced their Kinetic uh, Drive, and I didn't know if you guys had comment on you know, that's a good thing or an exciting thing or <coughs> just <laughs> a few it's guys. A it's a different use case than what we do right now, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they've announced it at several different summits. This isn't the first <laughs> oh, announcement, okay. certainly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But new and improved. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's really nice to see people innovating um, at the interface level on the disks. Um, I think my only challenge to them is that they've sort of picked a new API that has a lot of interesting properties and benefits or whatever, but they've still sort of fixed the API, and who knows whether that's gonna be sort of the right way to talk to a disk. Um, so I'm, personally, I'm more interested in the other, other vendor, HTST has a similar disk where you actually can put your own code on the disk and you can define whatever API you want, um, which I think is sort of opening up a whole world of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So I hope, I hope that Seagate, Seagate will follow suit. Great, thank you. All right, so it's, I think it's top of the hours, which means we're ending on time. Uh, one quick thing is, Mike, what's, uh, for the folks who may not know but might be interested in sitting in some of the design sessions, when is that? And do you, do you happen to know where, remember where? Yeah, so uh, I believe on, on Wednesday we're uh, set. So um, we're over, what, what is it, the, the hotel, the Meridian yeah, Hotel. And so just come on over. Uh, we start at 9 a.m., so bright and early. And... Uh, yeah, just find me. As, that's a good time. Also, if you if you see anything, have tried out Cinder, have anything missing, you know, reach out to me and as well as the rest of the core team. They're sitting up front too of Cinder. So, yeah, and John, of course. Great. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Um, so, thank you, panelists. Appreciate your time. Uh, thanks. For, uh, thank the audience for joining in.